Hi everybody, we're, uh, we're up to lecture 7 now and this is totally dedicated to Paul's second missionary journey. Last lecture we did his first one and we did the Council of Jerusalem. Now, totally devoted to the second missionary journey. Acts chapter 16, 17 and 18. So this is Paul's great mission to Europe, to Greece. We'll divide this particular lecture into six uh, different sections. The first will be the beginnings of this journey. Acts chapter 16 verses 1 to 10. Then we're going to look at, secondly, Paul in Philippi. Acts chapter 16, verses 11 to 40. Then it's Paul at Thessalonica and Beroea. And that's Acts chapter 17, verses 1 to 15. Fourthly, Paul at Athens. That's continuing chapter 17, verses 16 to 34. Fifthly, we'll look at Paul at Corinth, Acts chapter 18, verses 1 to 17. And finally, the second journey ends and the third begins, Acts chapter 18, verses 18 to 28. So, the first of these six sections now, the beginning of the second journey. Acts 16, 1 to 10. We ended last lecture, if you might remember, with Paul and his great friend and travelling traveling companion, the one who introduced him into Antioch and the one who was with him in his first mission, Barnabas. Sadly, they part company. Barnabas with John Mark go off to Cyprus, which is Barnabas, Barnabas' birthplace, while Paul and his new travelling companion, Silas, head for Syria and Cilicia, and as they go, they strengthen the churches which have already been established by Paul. At Lystra, they're introduced to a certain Timothy, who will become a dear friend and a co-worker. Timothy, as we can possibly tell, is a Greek name, meaning honouring God. His father is Greek, his mother is Jewish. So it's a mixed marriage. Fitzmaier says there's no evidence at this time in history that in Judaism children took the religion of their mother something that happened later in Judaism Paul has Timothy circumcised in the words of Luke so that he's more acceptable in the rather the argumentation of Luke that he's more acceptable to the Jewish community so after this, Paul keeps passing on to the communities the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem. This is the last time we have a reference to the apostles in Jerusalem. The focus now is not on Jerusalem, but it was going to become onto Asia and Europe. Paul is led by the Spirit to go to a port on the northeast of Asia Minor. The port is called Troas, which was very close to the ancient city of Troy. You can sense that from the name. And was the usual embarkation port for heading to Greece. Father Michael Fallon reminds us that the distance covered in these few verses of uh, 
leaving Antioch, etc., right up to here, is vast. It's one and a half thousand kilometers. And it's a Troas that he has a vision of a Macedonian imploring, come across to Macedonia and help us. Macedonia is a mountainous area in the north of Greece and became the leading power in Greece from the 4th century on. When the Romans conquered the area two centuries later, they founded a number of Roman colonies, therefore Greek, uh, Latin speaking, at Dyrrachium on the Adriatic coast, at Pala and at Philippi. Once he had seen this vision, we lost no time in arranging a passage to Macedonia. We lost no time. Suddenly, we. And it's the first of the famous so-called we passages. Who was the we? Well, many people would say, as that great classicist scholar Colin Hamer says, that the jump from the third person into the first person plural indicates that Luke has come aboard and he's part of the story at this particular uh, stage. Now we move to Paul at Philippi, Acts chapter 16, verses 11 to 40. So leaving Troas, uh, they overnight at Samothrace, an island um, which was famous for having a very high mountain which the sailors looked to to help them in their journeys. And then after that they reached Neapolis. Neapolis, new city. It's interesting, Naples is that, Neapolis, and also in the Holy Land today, Nablus was Neapolis, new city. It's a fairly common name in the ancient world. And here we have Neapolis, the port city of Philippi. Philippi is Roman and Latin speaking. Interestingly, Mark Anthony settled this place with ex-soldiers after his victory over Brutus and Cassius. In 42 BC, Philippi becomes the very first city to be evangelized by Paul in Europe and a city that was always very, very dear to him. And we have a wonderful letter written by him back to that community he loved and founded, a letter from Paul to the Philippians. It lies on the great Roman road, the Via Ignatia, which stretched some 1200 kilometers from Dyrrachium on the Adriatic coast through places like Pella and Thessalonica to Philippi, where we're now at, right over to Byzantium, which in the fourth century, of course, becomes Constantinople. On the Sabbath day, Paul and Silas go down by the river where the Jews gather. They probably don't have a synagogue in Philippi. And they come across the delightful Lydia, who is obviously rather wealthy, as she's in the purple dye trade and is head of a household, and her home is large enough to offer Paul and Silas hospitality. The apostles preach and the Lord opens her heart and she and all her household are baptized. This will happen a few more times. A person and the whole household is baptized. In Philippi, Paul and Silas are harassed, or harassed rather, by a fortune teller or clairvoyant. Just as Peter confronted Samaritan magic way back in chapter 8, so now Paul confronts 
Greco-Roman divination. She shouts out everywhere, These men are slaves of the Most High God, who proclaims a way of salvation. In some comical way, perhaps, she's letting the Philippians know what Paul and Silas are on about. But she's tiresome. She's yelling out after them. And Paul exercises the evil spirit within. And her minders are furious. And they therefore drag Paul and Silas before the city magistrates. Johnson in his commentary says that the scene with the magistrates is thumbnail in size, but full of the authentic feel of Mediterranean urban life. It's, it's a wonderful little scene. Paul will say elsewhere that they were treated shamefully there and end up being beaten by rods and thrown into prison with their feet in the, stock, in the stocks. And we have a beautiful scene of in prison, lost in prayer. The miraculous earthquake becomes the occasion for the conversion of the jailer, who rather beautifully asks them, what must I do to be saved? Isn't that a great question? And of course, the classic response is, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. And as for Lydia, he and his household are baptised. So Luke's giving us, at this beautiful place of Philippi, the story of a man and a woman and their respective conversions. Luke's great sensitivity to the equality of the sexes. Now we move to the third section out of the six, Paul at Thessalonica and Beroea, Acts chapter 17 verses 1 to 15. After leaving Philippi, Paul and Silas travel some 150 kilometers west along the Via Ignatia. And they break their journey at Amphipolis. Amphipolis, the capital city of the first of four districts in Macedonia. A city which is built on both sides of a river. Amph Amphipolis. Hence the name, both-sided, two-sides, city. The second stop is Apollonia. And eventually they arrive at Thessalonica, the seat of the Roman consul and a significant city with a large Jewish community, unlike, of course, Philippi. Thessalonica has had an extraordinary history with many Paleo-Christian remains, the early church was impressively strong in that city. It was to become, by the 5th and 6th centuries, the second city in the whole of the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Empire. And under the Ottomans, in the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries, it was one of the great cosmopolitan cities of the world, Salonika, where Greeks, who were of course the Christians, Muslims and Jews lived peacefully together. They coexisted wonderfully really, right up until just before the First World War, when the Muslims were expelled, as the country is liberated from the Ottomans, and the Second World War when, of course, the Jews are annihilated. It's sad that we've lost a significant number of such magnificent cosmopolitan cities. It would seem that, from Paul's writings, that in 1 Thessalonians and Philippians 4.9, Paul stayed here for quite some time, certainly more than for the little period that Luke seems to suggest. 
He follows his usual strategy of visiting the local synagogue on the Sabbath and preaching Christ to the congregation. He's got some success. But he has more success with the Greeks and interestingly with some well-placed women. But of course history repeats itself when jealousy pushes some of the Jews to enlist the help of a gang from the marketplace to stir the crowd up and soon the whole city was in uproar. From verse 5. I wonder if Luke is trying to contrast the more refined Christian movement with some well-placed women, on the one hand, with the Jewish people who get their support from the lower class troublemakers. Who knows? The mob, failing to find Paul and Silas, drag a certain Jason. We know nothing more about him and some other Christians, some of the brethren, before the local city council with some rather serious charges. But eventually they're released on bail. The Christian community, in the light of all this, pack Paul and Silas off to Beroea, a city not on the Via Ignatia, and certainly outside of any influence from Thessalonica, it's on the road going south to central Greece. We read that here the Jews were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. And they welcomed the word very readily. Every day they studied the scriptures to check whether it was all true. Notice this time many Jews as opposed to just some Jews in Thessalonica, a number of Greek men, and again, many Greek women from the upper classes all become believers. When Jews from Thessalonica arrive in Beroea with the aim of disturbing all this, the community rather beautifully arranges for Paul to leave, and he ends up in Athens. The fourth section now out of the six is Paul in Athens. Acts chapter 17, verses 16 to 34. This scene is a very famous scene. Paul at the Areopagus in Athens. It's one of the standout scenes in our whole narrative. I'm sure we, we would realise that Athens has always been regarded as the great high point of the of cultural and intellectual adventure we call classical civilization. For the ancients, it was their philosophical and cultural mecca. Paul's visit, therefore, takes on a very special meaning. It's the meeting between Judaism on the one hand and the prevailing culture, Hellenism, on the other. It's the world of revelation meeting the world of philosophy. So Athens really is the ideal setting for Paul's evangelical appeal to educated and cultured Gentiles. The Areopagus, what's that? Well, the Areopagus originally was the hill to the west and northwest of the Acropolis, right up on top of the hill, um, just above Athens. It was called, it's called Areopagus, Hill of Mars. Mars, the god of war. It was an open air space, open to all sorts of speakers, and where the Supreme Judicial Council had its seats. In Paul's day, however, it held its sessions no longer up near the Acropolis, but in the Royal Arcade, which was also the place where the different philosophers held their discussions, the key debating place in the city. So we see Paul 
moving out of the synagogue right into the marketplace. If we remember that Paul grew up in Tarsus, where he would have become familiar with philosophy, and especially with Stoicism, as the Stoics had a leading school in Tarsus. Some of the philosophers, after debating with Paul, say, in rather, in, in slang, a, a Athenian slang, does this parrot know what he's speaking about? And others said, because he was preaching about Jesus and the resurrection, he sounds like a propagandist for some outlandish gods. That's the reaction to hearing about Jesus and his resurrection. After being invited then to speak before the judicial council, Paul delivers a rather powerful speech, which is really beautiful and has always appealed to me and I'm sure to many of us. And it shows us a rather detailed knowledge of Athens and the beliefs of the Athenians and their customs. It's a wonderful speech and it appeals to these Athenians through their sense of God which they've gained through observing the natural world around them. Firstly, he compliments them on their piety in having an altar inscribed to an unknown God. Adding rather brilliantly, the God whom I'm proclaiming now is in fact the one you already worship without knowing it. He then speaks touchingly of the God who gives life and breath to us all. So that, and he quotes, and I quote, all nations might seek the deity and by feeling their way towards him, succeed in finding him. Witnessing to the religious instinct that every human being has deep within. He then reminds his audience, by quoting some of their own authors, that God is not far from any of us. Indeed, we are all his children. We have a special personal relationship with our Creator. He condemns all the pagan idols because God, he says, is not like that. God is greater. He calls them to repent, to look towards the real God, and to acknowledge the one who, raised, who was raised from the dead, Jesus. And we know that at the mention of the was raised, the resurrection, many people who were comfortable with the immortality of the soul thought resurrection of the body absurd, and so they laughed. But others, however, were attracted to what he said, including a certain Dennis the Areopagite, Dennis the Areopagite, Dionysus, the Areopagite, famous because there is a, a man by that name uh, who wrote, who was a monk of the 5th century, he wrote an extraordinary mystical treatise. And also, somebody mentions, not to be confused with St. Denis, who is the uh, Bishop of Paris. I don't know if this is right, but I remember Saint Denis is, uh, is, is Saint Denis in, uh, in, in French, and from that we get the word Sydney, but I don't know if that's correct, or not, but I've heard that. Okay, the, uh, the fifth section is Paul at Corinth. Now we're moving into that last chapter, Acts 18, verses 1 to 17. Paul travels to Corinth, the great metropolis, of 300,000 souls. Extraordinary big city in those days. Although, one author points out, they had many, many slaves within that number. It dominated the narrow isthmus, which connects the southern part of Greece, the Peloponnesus, with the northern part, the rest of Greece. In Paul's day, it was 
the political center, Corinth, the greatest metropolis in in, in Greece. It's, it succeeded uh, Macedonia. And Gallio was the proconsul for the best part of a year in that city. It was a great port city, sometimes called the Corinth of the Two Seas. Because the northern port, Lycaon, was on the Gulf of Corinth and it opened up onto the Adriatic Sea and therefore to Italy, while the southern port, uh, Cenchrea, was on the Savonic Gulf and it faced the Aegean Sea and Asia. Like all port cities, it was quite cosmopolitan and uh, many, di many different languages were spoken there. It was uh, sexually lax. There was a fair bit of promiscuity and uh, prostitution. It was a melting pot for different uh, religions and hosted the Isthmus Games every two years. It also ha had a famous healing sanctuary, the Esculapios, which also attracted many people seeking help. So what a, an extraordinary and wonderful place for Paul to put down roots for some time, 18 months in fact, and found and pre preach and found a Christian community. He stays with a certain Aquila and Prisca, often called Priscilla, which is the, a diminutive form of Prisca, and an endearing way of speaking of Prisca. And this couple is quite exceptional. They dedicate their lives to the spread of the faith. They are like apostles. They remain firm friends with Paul for well over 15 years. And their names keep popping up in his letters. We know that the Emperor Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome in 49 AD, which explains why, as it says here, the Jewish Christian couple have now reached and live in Corinth. They are tent makers, like Paul. So they work with leather and uh, would make a lot of other things besides tents. At Corinth, we found I'm not sure when, but we have a marble stone with the inscription the synagogue of the Hebrews. It's just outside the city and it may be that there Paul did his preaching. After being insulted perhaps a number of times he leaves the synagogue saying your blood be on your heads from now on, I'm going to go to the pagans with a clear conscience. But we notice too, he just goes next door to the house of a certain Titius Justus. It's interesting, I think that's the second time that he says, I'm going to the pagans. But he still has his heart set on preaching first to the Jews. A synagogue official, Crispus, and his whole household become believers and are baptized, just like Lydia. Paul is going to refer to Crispus in his letters too. And a, a number of other Corinthians also become believers and are baptized. The Lord appears to Paul in a vision and tells him that he's going to be safe in Corinth. So he decides to stay there for 18 months. Then we see a serious incident during his stay when the Jews bring Paul before the proconsul Gallio. Interestingly, he happens to be Seneca, Seneca's older brother. They accuse Paul of preaching an illicit religion, something which couldn't, they think, be considered Jewish. Gallio, however, dismisses the charge as 
Well, it's an internal Jewish dispute. He sees it still as a splinter group of Judaism. In fact, one commentator says, the first persecution of Christians only happens a decade later when Nero marries a Jewess, a Jewess, Poppia, in 62 AD. You know, Nero's persecution of the Christians in Rome around 64. The tribunal from which a magistrate addresses his pe the people is still in the centre of the Corinthian marketplace and uh, what well, it used to be back in those days flanked by shops. It was called a bema in Latin, rostra, rostrum. And we probably uh, become familiar with what it means if we think of the uh, the legal bench that we speak about. And finally now we come to the sixth part of this lecture, the final part. The second journey ends, the third starts, and we have a new recruit, Apollos. Acts chapter 18 verses 18 to 28. Paul leaves Corinth after that long 18-month period there. He visits Ephesus, which is the capital of the province of Asia, on the west coast of Asia, before returning home to Antioch via Caesarea Maritima and possibly Jerusalem. We're not sure if that's what's meant. And so he ends the second mission. It would seem he stays in Antioch for quite some time too, perhaps even again over 18 months. That's, that's always been his home base. When he was at Ephesus, just in passing through, Luke foreshadows that Paul's going to come back there when he says, God willing, I'll come back to you again after the, the locals try to get him to stay with them a bit longer. God willing, I will come back to you again. God willing, I'll see you tomorrow. God willing, we'll have a meeting next week. It's a very old biblical expression, but many people still use it even up to today. It's a rather beautiful acknowledgement that everything's in the hands of God. So Ephesus is going to be central to the third mission. Now this final scene in this lecture is the figure Apollos. And he comes from the great metropolis in Egypt, Alexandria, founded by Alexander the Great himself. It was a famous city in antiquity as a centre of learning, with a great library and a great museum. And for the Jewish people, it was their centre of Hellenistic learning. It was there that the Bible was translated from Hebrew, into Greek. It's the Septuagint version of Scripture. Justly very, very important and famous. Apollos is described as an eloquent man with a sound knowledge of the Scriptures. If he'd been brought up uh, in a religious fashion in Alexandria, that would be exactly as he would be. It seems a bit strange that he's preaching about Jesus, but knows only the baptism of John and he needs the help of Priscilla and Aquila before he can be become a true believer, a full believer. And Michael Fallon suggests that Luke is presenting Apollos to us as a sort of John the Baptist figure preparing the way for Paul's time in, in Ephesus. So in conclusion this lecture really just covers Paul's second missionary journey, which was basically, as we see, to Greece, the cities of Greece. He evangelizes in first in Philippi, the Latin-speaking city, where the lovely Lydia has her house. Then in Thessalonica, where he stays for some time, but is forced to flee to Beroea, where the Jews are more open than at Thessalonica, and many 
upper class Greeks join us. Then preaches, evangelizes in Athens where he delivers that beautiful speech addressing fully the pagans, the Gentiles. And finally he preaches in Corinth, the great metropolis, where he teams up with Aquila and Priscilla and over a, f a long period of 18 months he establishes the church in that great port city. The Apostle Paul indeed has begun the evangelization of Europe. Thank you.